G'day, friends. Yes, you're looking at the right channel. I'm crocheting. It's crochet at a very fine gauge, but it's still crochet. I know a few folks out there are looking at the way I'm fumbling through these stitches and thinking I'm doing it wrong, and that's okay. I don't particularly care. I only taught myself to crochet last year, so it's not like I have years of experience. Just let me know in the comments down below if you feel there's something I can improve on. And you may be wondering why I'm crocheting, or what I'm crocheting. It's a vintage sample for an upcoming project, and that's all I'm going to say on the subject for now. I figure you'll probably be knitting, or sewing, or otherwise crafting while you listen to this. It's probably the closest to podcast style as I've done for years. I found my spring steel boning last week while looking for something entirely different in one of my storage drawers, and it set me off on a tangent that not only gave me big ideas, but also stopped me dead in my tracks. See, YouTube really likes it when you upload videos regularly. Once a week is really good if you can't post more often. Process videos of knitting and other handcrafts take time to put together, and while I like what I did with the Victorian scarf, I did feel a bit rushed. I'm still in that fresh dewy glow of getting a dopamine rush every time someone watches a single video, so the logic is to make as many videos as possible as quickly as possible to keep that feeling going for as long as possible. That's a lot of possibilities. And I just don't want to burn out, or get so sidetracked on what I should do, that things like the ongoing sock project get pushed aside until the last minute. After I found the spring steel, I went looking for my other old costuming... stuff. See, I don't know if I mentioned it, and if I did mention it, whether I underlined it, but I have a lot of interests. The Venn diagram of my interests is... vast. When it comes to crafty skills, I started with counted cross-stitch, moved on to costume sewing, and then picked up knitting and more recently crochet. I'm one of those silly multi-craftual types that takes a look at a piece of handwork and thinks, huh, I could do that. I want to learn black work and fine embroidery. The only reason I haven't taken up tatting is because it's my sister-in-law's thing and I haven't wanted to intrude on her space. You have no idea how close I am to asking her for lessons, and Sean, if you're listening, I'm willing to learn if you want to teach me basics. We can commiserate over the pros and cons of steel versus plastic shuttles until everyone else at the table's eyes glaze over. The beauty of YouTube is that I can use my short-lived art college background in integrated media, film and video in particular, alongside my other artistic and technical skills. While you could loosely term my work in front of the camera as performance art, I have yet to find any application at all for the course I took in holography. I did get to play with lasers though, and while I'm not sure it was worth the money I paid to do so, if you have a chance to play with lasers, you should take it. At very least, YouTube is a good outlet for my creativity. Whether it evolves into anything else remains to be seen. So yes, if you stick around and hit that subscribe button, you probably will see me discuss an era from the construction of the underwear to the development of its lace trim, taking lazy stops along the way to look at the pop music of the time and the technological innovations. Because that's just how I roll. I recently watched Miss Philomena's One Day Costuming Challenge make of an Edwardian corset cover with hand-knit lace and everything in me screamed yes. I mean, obviously we're talking hand-pounding the table, the word yes having a longer A vowel sound in the middle, and maybe the word queen tacked onto the end, but I literally can't do that voice. At any rate, I had been wondering if anyone had gone so far as to make their own edging and insertion lace because it was something I just wasn't seeing and it made me so happy. So very happy. Because this is the level of detail I find fascinating and have been hoping to implement in my own garments. As a knitter, I have books that go into detail about edgings, but these days you only ever seem to see them on baby blankets or shawl edges. That sort of thing. There are so many things to which I could and would apply edging if I didn't think it would look strange. So, bearing this in mind, I hunted up my old costuming storage. Time has not been kind to it. I'd had the vision of recreating a Tudor-style gown, 
Not based on any extant paintings, mind you. I wasn't looking for that level of detail. I started working on this thing somewhere around 2004 during the time of live journal and before the time of YouTube. YouTube just like literally was not a thing. Let me just say that live journal was great for finding communities. Gothy young 30 something with a love of costumes wanders into that atmosphere and next thing you know you're subscribed to groups about costuming, corsetry, and which black lipstick wears best. The brocade bodice from my jacquard video comes from that era. I'd met up with a young Ryerson fashion student who had an interest in corsetry and she drafted a set of modern patterns for me. I'm looking forward to getting back down to that size range so I can dig those patterns out of storage and reuse them. So I made some underbust corsets, worked from my friend's patterns, and made myself an Elizabethan effigy corset. At least a mock-up. I meant to rework the underarms as they're rather uncomfortable but never got around to it. Let me tell you, driving a car whilst wearing an Elizabethan effigy corset was not a good experience. Two out of ten would not do again. What bits and pieces of my foray into costuming and clothing making are very modern. Remember, this was the early 2000s when you were more likely to see grommets covered in embroidery thread rather than hand-sewn eyelets. At this point in time, even hardcore original practice ladies were swooning over the Shakespeare in Love pattern, so I feel no shame for my own past costuming sins. I have an actual grommet press in the basement. No, not a block of wood with the pin and mallet that we see most often on YouTube when someone finds a use for them. An actual grommet press. I'd planned on making myself more modernish corsets before I was massively sidetracked. I think I managed to get a bare-bones Elizabethan-inspired ensemble put together. The makeshift hoop skirt is probably still lurking somewhere in our basement under stair storage, and then we moved and all my stuff wound up in storage or being shifted from one space to another. I think I wore it precisely once for a Vampire the Masquerade LARP I was in at the time. Knitting replaced costuming as it was infinitely more portable, and that was that. The first costuming project that should have been completed, the Schmies, is still unfinished. I wore my corset and Elizabethan gown such as it was with bare skin like a heathen. I found my chemise in one of those modular plastic drawers Rubbermaid makes. It was stored in our garage for over 10 years and the elements have not been kind. It was musty and stained and a couple of the pins had rusted into place where I'd pinned a hem that was never finished. I ripped the pins out of it and tossed it in the wash. I figured I could try to salvage it. Yeah, that's not happening. The chemise was always too small. It always fit tightly over the chest. Now that I'm older and wiser, I can say that it's because I didn't realize you could buy muslin in different widths. It's also stained, even after it's wash. I could probably douse it in bleach, but all that would accomplish is to make my laundry room and thus my open concept main floor an affront to one's delicate nose. What are we to do then? Why, well, make a new chemise, of course. You notice that today we aren't making a new chemise, right? We're crocheting impossibly thin thread that is apparently not impossibly thin enough, but will do in a pinch. If you think you know what I'm making, stick it down in the comments because I'd like to know what you think about where I'm going with all this. Right. We aren't making a new chemise because while I went out and bought new fabric, I have no idea which era I want to work towards. Seriously, I sat down this morning and said, right, I'm going to make schmees, and I was confronted with, well, it wasn't a smorgasbord of options, more like a small buffet and Uncle Percy's stolen off with the cheese cubes. Either way, while the schmees hasn't changed much, it's a garment kinda in the wheelhouse of ain't broke, don't fix, there are a few changes over a five or six hundred year stretch that would use the fabric in different ways. Do I want to retry the Elizabethan era? Not particularly. Having to finagle a hoop skirt and a bum roll was vaguely annoying the first time around, and I don't feel like repeating the process quite yet. The Regency holds some interest. I do enjoy my Austin. 
I've read Pride and Prejudice and Sense and Sensibility a couple of times each and find Austin's commentary on wealth and class to be really interesting. There's something the movies really can't help but gloss over because you have to cram a lot of story in a short amount of time. But if you can flip your brain into understanding the vernacular in which Austin writes, it's really worth the effort. If you don't believe the work gets that political, take a look at the first chapter of Sense and Sensibility in which the brother of the main characters talks with his wife about how to nickel and dime the actual amount of support they're willing to give the surviving family after the death of his father. It's completely vicious and it distills the worth of an unmarried woman down to the last shilling. But I digress. The other era that seems to be coming up a lot, particularly amongst my fellow YouTubers, is 1890s Belle Epoque. I can understand why it's late Victorian with foreshadowing of early Edwardian, which holds a lot of interest for history bounders and costumers alike. It seems the style of Hogwarts is generally informed by early Edwardian witch, so I'm not about to raise a fuss. There was also a ball or some other function to be held in England that has since been delayed until international travel is permitted and safe, so it's not like folks don't have a reason to want a Worth gown of their very own. And the Worth gowns are lovely, I'll admit it. I just don't think there's one suited to my shape and style, however, so I'll give it a miss this time around. What does intrigue me is Canadian historical fashion. One could argue that as Canada is a British colony stuck right at the top of the United States, that the fashion is just generic British American, and you might be right, but I'd like to delve into it deeper on my own. I'd like to see just what kind of tweaks and hacks Canadians on either side of the class spectrum wore to survive in our northern environment. Like, did we use more furs than normal, or did we use less because they were being exported to Britain? Did we lean closer to European fashion or to US fashion, and if the former, were we out of date by any amount of time due to the amount of time it took for people, books, and magazines to travel overseas? Would my Victorian scarf from 1876 be fashionable in the 1880s or 90s? I have questions. Either way, we'll see whether I can even find the resource material I'm looking for. My parents have some very old family photos from the late Victorian, early Edwardian period that I'm hoping we can locate and find some inspiration in. Until then, my chemise project, as well as other era-specific costumes, are on hold. I have a couple of other ideas that fit more in the category of history bounding that I'd like to explore while I get used to using a sewing machine again. I think that once I have a better idea of where I'm going with all this, I can formulate a plan of attack that will give these videos a bit more cohesion while they entertain. In the meantime, I'm going to keep working on this wee lace project and we'll see where it goes. If all is well, it will make a reappearance in another video shortly. Because if this doesn't prove too challenging or time intensive, you can believe I have plans for it. I'm going to get back to work on my crochet and my master plan. I hope your weekend is going well. Why not drop me a line in the comments about what you're working on? Do you have a knitting project on the needles? Are you working on a vast multi-step costuming adventure? I want to know! If you haven't already, please click the subscribe button, and if you'd like to know when I post new videos, the bell is your buddy. I aim for Sundays, but you never know what could happen, so the bell could make all the difference. Till then!